praise and worship song there. I didn't know what was going on. Hallelujah. He's good. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Oh, let's pray over the word tonight. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that it is moving and it's alive and it's active on the inside of us. And God, we just thank you that it's doing mighty things. And we just honor your presence in this house tonight, God. And we just ask right now that you would just sanctify this time, that you would set it apart as holy, and that, God, you would put on deposit on the inside of us things that we can take out of this place and that we can apply and, and just make application in into our lives, Father, that we may just see you move in a greater measure because we all know that we were born for more. And I just thank you right now for breathing. Just God breathe on this word and on your scripture tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I keep saying that I'm done. And uh, I am done tonight, okay? But when I left here on Sunday, uh, there were some things that I had not had a chance to be able to get to that I wanted to finish up um, and talking about how the Word works on the inside of us. And so I'm going to go full circle tonight back to the very beginning of the scripture that we used when we began um, this Word Works um, series. And it was 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13. And uh, I just have uh, another scripture that we're going to go to. We're going to go to Hebrews 4, um, uh, verse 12 here in just a second. But I, I don't think I would be doing the word working any justice if I didn't bring out this scripture in Hebrews. But I want to start back with, um, in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Where it says, and we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is effectively at work in you who believe. This word is effectively at work on the inside of you. And what is the word doing? You know, the word comes with a purpose. And, you know, I, I can always remember back years ago um, and that Kevin Leal would make a statement and he would say, the presence of God doesn't come just to give you goosebumps. The presence of God comes with a purpose. And I would say that with the Word of God. The Word of God comes because it has a purpose. It is alive. It is the Word of God. It is effectively working on the inside of you. And while it is working in you, how it works in you is the Word forms things. We briefly mentioned on Sunday back in Genesis where it said that the Spirit of God in the beginning, that God created the heavens and the earth, and it talks about how the Spirit was hovering over the waters that the earth was without form and it was without void it was void so when we look at how the earth was formed by the word of God we see that the first thing that the word did when God spoke was it formed something something began to be not that wasn't before came into being. And so when we look at it, that is no different today. Those words of creation are as powerful today as they were in Genesis 1, when the earth was formed. And when we look and see, this is the purpose of the Word of God in our lives. He's trying to form something on the inside of you. Remember the verse this church was birthed on, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new what? Creation. Creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. The first thing that happens when the Word begins to get formed in you is you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and the creative power of God begin to work. The Word is dropped on the inside of you. Jesus came with flesh on. Amen? And that Word drops down on the inside of you, and it is meant to do something. Sometimes people look at the Word, and it's just like, oh, that's a great story. Oh, that sounds real inspiring. But you know what? The world would be a lot better place if we had an understanding that it was working in us. It was forming something in us. It was being effective on the inside of us. And we could maybe truly begin to believe we were a new creation 
in Christ Jesus if we truly believe that the word was forming something. And so you would look and you would think, um, what in the world is, the, is it forming inside of us? Godliness? Passion? Faith? Steadfastness? All the fruit of the Spirit being worked in us, those things are being formed. They're being molded. You know, we talk all the time about God being the potter and we're the clay. What does the potter do? He forms, he molds, he makes that pot in that clay exactly what it, he wanted it to be. And that is exactly what the Word of God wants to do on the inside of us. It was meant to form you so that you didn't look like the world anymore. Because when the word gets on the inside of us, we should not be looking like the world. I don't know why we try so hard to fit into a place that we don't look like. Because the inside of you doesn't think like the world does. You don't, you don't chase the things the world does. Amen? Because the word is being formed in you. And so we have to really um, take a minute and just think about it. Man... The words, let there be light, and there was light, was formed. Let the heavens, let it, it's all there. Let everything be divided. Let it all be separated. This was all done in Genesis by the word of God. And why do we look at it today like it has less power today than it had on the very first day that God created? The word doesn't wear out. The word's everlasting. Amen? And it's still, it's still out there. But yet at the same time as believers, we will take words and we will be idle with them. They will be powerless. We will be gossipers. We will backbite people. We will take the very things that God wanted to use and we will use it for the enemy. Because we don't understand the power of word. Amen? And so it's forming these things on the inside of us. Here's the reason why. Because when the word's formed on the inside of you, and you've become what God wanted you to be, you are now unshakable. The world can shake, rattle, and roll all it wants to. But if the word is formed on the inside of you, I'll call it, if the word is set it like stone on the inside of you, you're not going to be moved by anything that's going on anywhere around you. And so when we look at this word, the word of God that is effectively working in you, if you look that word up, it literally translates to energy. Amen. The word is energy. It's energy. It's moving. And it's alive on the inside of you. And so we have to keep in mind all the time that those words, I don't know about you, but it doesn't sound like it's dead to me. How people can read their Bible and say, I don't get anything out of the Bible. I, I, it, it's, it's alive. It's full of power. It's full of energy. How can we read it and say that, well, it didn't do anything for me. Well, guess what? That's not God's problem. Because it's that same powerful word. But it's us. It's us that has to allow that part of our new creation, of our being. That's why it's so important when people first get saved, they need word on the inside of them. Now, granted, I'm a teacher, so word's very important to me. Amen? And, but at the same time, that is the foundation. I remember years ago having a dream, and I didn't have any idea, never preached a sermon in my life, and I said, God, what is it that you want me to do? And I walked into a room, and I walked into this classroom of like little kindergartners, and I'm like, no, God, that's not it. But in the dream, I looked around, and when I looked around at this room full of little kindergartners, all I saw was not the kindergartners that were there. All I saw was the ABCs that they put along the top of the wall. And I knew that's what I'm supposed to do. You got to give the foundational teachings. For anybody to be able to grow in God, they got to have a foundation on the inside of them. Now, you may think A, B, C is a little bit boring, but guess what? There was a day when it was hard for you to learn that. Amen. <laughs> 
there was a day when it gets tough to be able to learn those things. And this is why the Word is so important on the inside of it. it is, you're not going anywhere else with Jesus without some Word being formed on the inside of you. Amen? We want to hear it. We want to listen to it. Sometimes even be able to repeat it. But we don't allow God to get His hands down inside of us. We don't allow Him to put His hands on the clay. It's okay to watch from afar as sister so-and-so is going through her process. But God over here, you know, I'm good. You know, I'm good. I'll just stay here on the wheel and I'll just watch what's going on over there. Well, you're never going to be formed into what God wanted you to be. Because you've got to let him put his hands on you. You've got to let him get his word down inside of you. And then you've got to let it work. So we know that the word forms. But my point tonight is I want you to go to Hebrews 12. Because I think this is something that we miss a lot when we talk about the Word of God. How many of you talk about, man, you just, you just want to fall in love with the Word. You just love the Word of God. You just get so many nuggets out of the Word of God. We love to be exhorted when, you know, when we're in the Word of God. But the Word is for more than just exhortation. Amen. The Word about the, this is, there's a lot in here besides, bless me, Lord. There's a lot in here. And for us to be formed into what God wants us to be, we got to see it. Hebrews 4.12. For the Word of God is alive and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Amen? Now let me tell you something. We've been talking about that, haven't we? We've been talking about how active and alive the Word is. It's living. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It will pierce. That means it'll go right through. It'll go right through you. It'll pierce the dividing of your soul and your spirit, which man cannot do. Man can't divide the soul and spirit. We talk about being body, soul, and spirit, but we don't know where that dividing line is, but the Word of God knows how to divide that. Amen? And it says that he's, He is a uh, division of the soul, the spirit, the joints, and the marrow. And then it says He's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. When we look at it, in many of the versions, it says it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. And so what I want to focus on for just a few minutes tonight, because I wanted to be able to, to finish this up. I want to look at God's word is meant to bring judgment to you. And I don't know what it is, but there's something on the inside of us that we literally don't like that word judgment. It's like a curse word in the church. But do you know what? The Bible tells us that we're to judge ourselves. The Bible gave us the word of God to be able to judge our own actions, thoughts, attitudes with. And if we don't judge those things in ourselves, we are not going to reach the form that He wanted us to have. Because just being in the Bless Me Club doesn't, it might get you to heaven, but it's not going to help you reach your maximum capacity as a believer in Jesus Christ. Amen? So we're meant to measure ourselves, and we don't measure it against what you know. You measure it against the Word of God. And so when we look at it, how do you do that? God, is this you, or is this not? We have to ask questions. Did this thought come from you? Or did this thought come from me? Or did this thought come from the devil? We have to learn how to hear. And we have to know that, come on, our Bible tells us that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Now, I don't know if you think your heart's excluded from that, but I don't think any of us are excluded from that. The heart is deceitfully wicked. That means your heart deceives you. It'll deceive you. 
And you don't even know it's deceiving you because you think you're right. In your mind, you think you're right. Your mindset, the way you were taught, no matter what it is, how you've thought things about the Word of God. But when we really bring it right down, you know, we get all caught up in the beginning of this verse and we quote it all the time. You know, this is the Word of God. It's alive. It's active. It's full of energy. Get to the Amplified Bible. You'll be going on for five minutes. Amen? It'll be full of energy. But we don't put a lot of emphasis on, but it judges the thoughts and intents, the attitudes Amen. of our hearts. We don't even think about that part of it. And so I could not close this series out without bringing this up. Because I don't know about you, but we are constantly justifying ourselves. Amen? All the time. Kevin Leal makes a statement. The mind will justify what the heart has chosen. The mind will always justify your behavior. If you want to walk in unforgiveness, your mind will justify. Your conversation will justify why I do not have to do this. Because I have to do this for me. I cannot forgive. I cannot this. So our mind justifies what this deceitfully wicked heart chooses. Wow. And if we don't bring that into a judgment of God on our own, we're going to find ourselves entering into heaven and him looking at us like, wait a minute, we got a problem. And it's going to be too late to fix the problem when we get there. Because when we get there, that's final judgment. <laughs> so why don't we take care of dealing with this stuff now in our hearts? Amen? We look at so many Christians that walk around year after year after year with so many thoughts in their mind. So many things coming out of our mouths that are not pure. They're not holy. There's no praise in it. There's no nothing. It's, it's just, it's unhealthy. It's unwholeness. It is filthy stuff that comes out of us. And it's like, how in the world do we get to the point that we can bring ourselves and allow the Word of God to begin to judge? The judgment that God's talking about here, He's not talking about the world. He's talking about Christians. He's saying this is what the Word of God is. And this is what it's for. And this is the purpose of how you use it. Amen? He literally, if you go back and you read in the, and we don't have time to do that tonight, but you literally pull up, you'll, talk, you'll see that that Hebrews 12 is really attached to them dealing with Christians that did not, could not enter into His rest because of their unbelief. Yes. Because they did not mix their words with faith. They couldn't enter into his rest. And so he talks all these in chapter 2 and chapter 3 for he keeps talking about don't harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion. Don't harden your hearts. And then he goes on and he tells us and it literally said you know so that you can enter into his rest. Well his rest is believing in him. It's not having that spirit of unbelief in you. You can rest when you believe God. Amen? And so that's the context that this scripture is actually wrote in. For the Word of God is sharp. It's powerful. It's active. It's energizing. And so the bottom line is this. We're not looking at the word judgment right. The word judgment is a good thing for a Christian. Because let's judge ourselves here. Yes. So we don't have to be judged there. Amen? And so we get... Now, this isn't for unbelievers. Because they're not capable of being able to do this. Amen? But for the believer, and I don't believe that the body of Christ is embracing this as we should. Amen. I believe that each of us should be looking at this like in a mirror. And we'll see, wait a minute, that's not right in my life. But we don't bring it under judgment. That's good. We don't bring that thought under judgment. We try to take it captive... <laughs> And it just keeps showing up. Because to the obedience of Christ means bring that thing under judgment. Yeah. That means get rid of it. <laughs> that means you literally stand and say, that thought is not from the Spirit of God. I judge that to death. That thought will have death in my mind. It will not enter my mind again. Yeah. 
I bring it under the judgment of death because it did not come from my heavenly father. And man, why, maybe this is why we can't get rid of some of these thoughts we have that torment people. Maybe this is why that even though the religious activity in the body of Christ seems to be going down, the mental problems in the body of Christ seems to be rising. Why could that possibly, could it possibly be we're not bringing our minds under the judgment of God? And this isn't negative. This is the most powerful thing that could set you free tonight. If you hear it with the right spirit. Because we're not condemning anything. I'm asking you to condemn what's not holy on the inside of you. And to literally bring that thing under judgment. Because the judgment of God is what will release you to life. It's what will get you free. Amen? It's death to the things of the world. It's death to that old man. It's death to the thoughts of mental illness that you fight constantly. All the stuff that comes in the world, we can literally speak judgment against it. But here's what Christians do. We live in compartmentalized lives. And we literally say, I'm going to church on Sunday. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm going out. By Friday night, I'm acting like a heathen. And it's okay because Sunday, out of that box and right back over here, hallelujah, praise the Lord, everything's going good. And we, oh, I'll judge myself right here in front of the, in front of the presence of God while the worship's going good. But on Friday night, it's all right. Nobody cares anything about what I'm doing anyway. I'll be able to get to church. So we try to just put our lives in a church box <laughs> and put that in that compartment of our hearts. And then this is the work compartment of our heart. Then this is the home life compartment of our life. And this is our friend compartment of our life. And we're a mess. We're an absolute mess. But God is meant to judge the thoughts and the attitudes. He wants to judge our actions. This is what we got to say. If it's not of God, let it be sentenced to death in my life. Let it be sentenced to death. That thought, that behavior, that thing that keeps tripping me up, I break the power of it in the name of Jesus. Amen? Let it be put to death. Here's what happens. We turn on the news. We've been hearing this for a year. We hear all these shootings. Everything's happening. And everyone gets on TV. Well, the Democrats say it's a gun problem. Oh, the Republicans say it's a mental health problem. And you know what? It's a God problem. Amen. Because nobody's bringing anything under the judgment of how we are supposed to act as Christians. And so it's not a mental health problem. It's not a gun problem. I'm just using it as an example. It's because we have not brought these things under the judgment that he's called us to do. People's thoughts are running rampant in their minds. And they continue to poison people because a little bit of sin leavens the whole thing. Once those things get in your mind, once you don't take that thing captive, once you don't sin that thought to judgment then all of a sudden it begins to grow it's like leaven and it begins to multiply and it begins to spread out into other areas of your life and I don't know about you but I think we have a problem because people are refusing to submit themselves to God for judgment because that word alone scares them amen. it's a scary word amen People refuse to say, God, this is what's going on in my mind. I don't want you to look at it. I just want you to tell me, God, is it godly or is it not? Because <laughs> if it's not, I've got to put that thought to death right now in the name of Jesus. How do you think people end up in extramarital affairs? They took a thought. They didn't judge it. They didn't sentence it to death in their life. They didn't look in the Word of God and, taught, and, and think about the one that they had at home that God put them together that no man would put asunder and they ne never brought it under the judgment of God and now here we have divorce all over the place. Amen? And so when the word of God comes and it begins to judge our thoughts, all of a sudden those thoughts that used to go rampant when you submit them to God, he's, you're literally going to start saying, no, wait a minute, that wasn't holy. That's not holy. That's not righteous. That, 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 that's, not a, that's not a good way to respond. That's not what God wants of me. And so we've got to quit letting this stuff just run rampant all throughout our lives. Because there is no freedom without judgment. Amen. There is no such thing as freedom without judgment. Let's look at a drug addict. Let's look at an alcoholic. What about every time they said, I need another fix. I need another drink. Just one more time. 
What if they brought that thought under the judgment and said, wow. I sentenced that thought to death. I don't need that. Wow. The word of God says, I just need him. You know, he, he's my source. He's the one. If I'm going to escape reality through anything, it's going to be through the word of God. <laughs> and we'll, we'll go, let's go. You want to escape reality? Go to the book of Revelations and start reading. Yes. You know what I'm saying? It's like we need to be able to have an understanding. Reveal those thoughts in my life. Sometimes this is what we do. Oh God, just you know, show me, show me anything. Search my heart, oh God. And just see if there be any wicked thing that you can find in me. And then he puts a finger on it. And we make an excuse for it. Instead of coming and saying, God, you're right. That's in me. That's ugly. That's not of you. That should bring us to tears. And then literally say, I put that thought to death. God, that wasn't of your spirit. Cleanse me now. Cleanse my mind from that evil thought. Amen? That it would not grow as leaven inside of my mind and take a hold of me. Let them words that are in my head, let them be put to the judgment test. May I take the Word of God and measure it up to the Word. May I take the thought that's going through my mind right now and put it up against the Word. Does it meet the test? Is it holy? Is it pure? Is it of a good report? All the things that it talks about in Philippians. Amen? It's not available to you, to the world, but it's available to you to be able to do this. Because the, word, the wor world cannot judge anything. It's already guilty. It's already been judged. Amen? And so it says it judges the thoughts or discerns the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Well, I only know of two different kinds of attitudes. Amen? God, I need you. God, I don't need you. Those are the attitudes we have. You either need him or you don't need him. And he knows the difference. He knows when those attitudes are there. When you literally have an attitude of God, I'm a drunk. I'm not. I'm a drunk. <laughs> well, you never know who might be watching and say, did you hear what she said? She literally confessed to the whole church she was a drunk. This is, I'm using it as an example. <laughs> you never saw that coming. When we look at that, we'd say, God, I'm a drunk. I can have two attitudes. God, I need you because I'm a drunk. Or God, I don't need you at all because this is my God over here. And so those are thoughts. And even though we don't think those are the thoughts, they are the thoughts that come into our mind because we make choices to choose other gods all the time especially where addictions and things like that are concerned amen but God wants to judge those things you know what you're not going to be able to be a good husband if you can't judge the stuff in your life you're not going to be able to be a good wife if you can't judge the things that are in your own life you're not going to be able to be a good parent if you can't judge certain things that are going on inside of your life inside of your home because the bottom line is without it you're in shackles you are in shackles. And so we literally have to have a, a, a way of just being able to say, you know what, you're either on your own throne or you're not. <laughs> God's on the throne or you're on the throne. Because for most Christians, the devil isn't on the throne, but self is on the throne. And the only way to get self off the throne is to judge self as a dead man. <laughs> I'm not allowed to have those thoughts. Why? Because I was crucified with Him. <laughs> I don't have the ability. I don't have the privilege. I don't have the freedom to think my own thoughts. Because i got to bring every thought captive to His obedience. Because this woman is supposed to be a dead woman. She's not even supposed to be able to think anything. I'm not supposed to have any wants, nothing of my own. It's all supposed to be, what am I? That's the old man. Then he said, was supposed to be done away with. Old things, old man, passed away, gone. Wow. New creation in Christ Jesus. That means godly thoughts. Amen? Godly desires. And so we have to have an understanding that this is what... I, I can't even articulate it like I want to tonight because I don't really think anyone um, thinks about it a lot. We think about... 
our thoughts and how to get rid of them. But can we really begin to say, I sentenced that thing to death. Wow. Because listen to just hearing me say that, don't you feel powerful? Devil, you ain't got no hold on me. I sentenced that thing to death right now in the name of Jesus. You ain't coming near my mind again. And if it comes in again, let me remind you. I already brought that thing captive. I already put death on that thing. Amen. I am not going to conceive that sin in my heart. I'm not going to do it because I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. That old woman that would have done all of that stuff, thought all that stuff, said all that stuff, it's all been judged. Amen? The Word of God is living. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of the soul and the spirit, the joint and the marrow, and it is a discerner of the thought and the intents of the heart. Judgment needs to quit being a curse word in the church. We need to be able to speak about it and not have people run out the door. She's judging me. No. But I will say, let the Word judge you. Go to the Word and let it judge you. And then judge yourself. And put that thing to execution. These are the thoughts, the intents. Not people. Don't judge people. Don't sentence people to death. We're talking about ourselves. We're talking about things that come in our mind that aren't good, that aren't holy. Amen? Passions, lusts, desires, all the things that we know better. We need to get rid of those things. And we need to just let it speak death to all of our sin. All the stuff that holds you back. Everything that entangles you in life. No, I speak death to that thing in the name of Jesus. That thought is not going to conceive because this is what happens. For sin to come, it had to be conceived. It had to get in the heart. It had to get in the heart. And it got in the heart because it got in the mind. And when it got in the mind and it conceived, that was the moment it dropped down in the heart and now it's not good. Oh, we sentenced that thing to death because that's the old man. Amen? Amen? Now let's move to verse 13. And it says, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now this is following the word of God is powerful and it's alive. So let's keep it all together. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It is piercing the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And, and, there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of who? Him. To whom we must, what? Give account. Every thought, every attitude, every intention that is on the inside of us, nothing is going to be hidden from Him. It is all going to be laid out there in the open. So we'd better be doing something with this junk that enters into our minds, that causes us to behave not like Christians, but to act like the devil. Amen? We better take a hold of this stuff. Why? Because there is a day coming that you're going to give account for all of it. I will give an account for all of it. Dr. Brian will give an account. There are no get out of, no passes, get out of jail free card. There is none of that. Amen? We are going to stand accountable. Nothing is hidden. It is impossible to hide a sinful thought from him. You may hide it from everybody around you, but you won't hide it from God. You got an issue and you think, oh, well, you know, I just can't stand this person. This person makes me so mad. It's God. It's late bear right in front of him. There ain't nothing that you think that is not right there in front of the presence of God. You can't even hide your motives for why you're doing what you do. 
You can't hide your motives when you witness. You can't hide your motives when you're sneaking around, when you're trying to get a promotion at work and you're going into the back door because you don't have the nerve to go through the front door. When you're cutting throat with a co-employee because you want the promotion and they don't want the promotion. Oh, honey, let me tell you what. It's all laid open. God sees it all. He sees every piece of it. He knows what you're thinking before you ever open your mouth. And if we do not verbalize what He already knows, He knows your inner silence. He knows all of it. He absolutely knows all of it. Everything is open and laid bare to the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. We have to make an account. Now I'm going to break down this word. This word open and laid bare is a word. You ever heard about a trach? Up through here? Yeah. Yeah, there you go, Eric. Open and laid bare. This verb, it's a verb. And it has the idea of Andy Commitment. Oh, your leg's asleep. I don't know if I can do this or not. Okay, bend down a little bit. Yeah, get, get on your knees. <laughs> yeah, you got to get down a little bit farther because i got to be able to get to you. Oh, they will stand up that way. Do you know how this? You see this right here? When you go to put someone in a stranglehold, do you see what someone's coming to do? They're going to take him out in the throat. This is the terminology for to open and lay bare. Are you having a hard time? Yeah. It's T R A C H E L I Z O, if anyone knows how to pronounce it. It means I'm taking you by the throat. It's used by wrestlers to take a strong stranglehold on another wrestler. Take a hold of that neck, bend it back, expose it so they can slit the throat. That's what the Word of God wants to do to us. It wants to put a stranglehold on you. It wants to slit it. It means what inside of your heart you better lay down as a sacrifice. Wow. Because what did they do to the animals? They slit the throat. Wow. And they laid them on the altar. They would slit. Because where? Life can be taken right here. And he said, this is what I want my Word to do. I want to cut out all that stuff. I want my word. I want it to be real. I want it to be open. I want it to be laid bare. Wow. See, it's compelling us to see ourselves. It's compelling us to judge ourselves. It, it's literally saying nothing, nothing hidden. We like to say nothing missing, nothing broken, because that's part of our salvation package. How about beginning with nothing's hidden from him? Nothing is hidden from him. And so this metaphor of this victim's throat being open and laid bare is just like a sacrificial knife that we are totally exposed, the human heart, to the eyes of an all-seeing God. He can see it all. And the reason he wants you to be able to see it all, know he can see it all, is so you can bring judgment to it. So that you can deal with it here while you're on this earth. You can deal with it yourself. And here we have to give an account to God. This word is meant to bring us life. But if we don't use it for the purpose of what it is, we're not going to be perfectly equipped and perfectly formed to be able to do what it is that God wants to do on the inside of us. The Word of God is meant to bring conviction. It's meant to bring guilt when you're guilty. Come on. Why in the world? I don't know what happened to... There was, a, a, there was a generation, I think, in the 60s and the 70s that sin. We preached hell. We preached fire. We preached brimstone. We preached... All, and all of a sudden, it just... All that went away. Because, don't you judge me. The last thing I want to do to go to church is someone to tell me that I'm going to hell. Like, I don't already know that. Anybody ever had someone tell them that? But no one understands the purpose. 
this word, I mean, it didn't use it as an analogy of a sword for nothing. Right. Wasn't like a little pocket knife. Wow. It's a sword. And it's sharp. And it's powerful. And it's meant to bring you life. But if we don't let the word penetrate, and we don't let it get down in the depths of our heart, come on. He wants to deeply wound you with the word. Because with that deep wound comes his healing power. Sometimes, you know, when you get infections and you get something, let's just say you get a sore and you get an infection all around that thing. Have you ever been to a doctor when they had to lance something? Oh my gosh. I had had a, a cystic thing on my back that I've had to have lanced I don't know how many times over the past 15 years. And every time I go into the surgery room, they've got it all. But you know what would happen? It was like little things that would get like oil glands would get infected and it had seeds in it. And they would say, I got it. I got it all. I've had three doctors in this town tell me I got it all. And I just laugh at them. I'll be back in about three years. Because it would always come back, wouldn't it? And when that thing would get infected, that thing would raise up on my back that big. I, it was horrible, wasn't it? It, it was awful. And they would lance that thing to get out all that infection and to get all that stuff out. And then they would clean it. And then they would sometimes stitch it. Sometimes they would pack it. It was not pretty. It was not pleasant. But when it was over with, within five to seven days, I'm like, thank you, Jesus, that thing is gone. You know, never to return. But they've always had a hard time getting all of it. We need to let God get deep enough on the inside of us so He can get it all. So that nothing begins to regrow. So that nothing comes back three years later that you thought you had conquered three and a half years ago. And then you're devastated because you thought you was free from that thing. But God sees everything and He knows there's still one little seed down on the inside of you. And that thing, it doesn't belong in your body. So it pushes its way up and all that junk that comes out of it literally was your friend because it was trying to push what didn't belong in you out of you. But boy, can it be painful if we don't let it be opened and laid bare. Wow. Good work. We've got to have the conviction of God back in the house of God. Yeah. The conviction of sin. All right. When someone comes to tell you, I just feel so guilty. Don't give them that. There's no for there. There is now therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Don't give them that scripture. Find out first if they're guilty. Amen. Because if they're guilty, you're erasing their conviction and telling them it's condemnation and they walk out and they haven't brought anything under judgment. That's good. And it's easy to do because we want to exhort someone. We want to tell them it's okay. It's okay to say, hey, is this true in your life? Can we agree with the adversary today so we can get you free? Is that if there's any seed of truth to what you are thinking or saying or feeling, is this conviction or is this condemnation? Amen? We don't need to be just gently scratched. We're not talking about a little tiny scab. We're talking about deep wounds. Laying low to the sense that eternal life is at the root of all of this. And I don't want a seed of death in me, do you? I don't want any of that on the inside of me. But we're never going to be renewed in our whole mind. We're never going to let this Word do the work that it wants to do inside of us until we lay this old man down and we allow him, amen, to die by the sword to judge those thoughts those intents that are in her heart. His word has power. And his word searches every part of your soul. Every part of your spirit. That heart, the central part of you. 
His word is literally deciding, is that affection you have godly or ungodly? I don't know about you, but I can look back on my life and I think, man, I, if I would have applied this <laughs> 30 years ago, 40 years ago, as just a new believer, I wonder how many things I would have never had to go around the mountain 15 times to get free from. The Word wants to form something on the inside of us. And that's great. And we want this Word to work mightily on the inside of us. But I would not be doing this series any justice if I didn't go on to say, but this Word also has to judge the thoughts and the intents of your heart. And it's a tough message. And you probably won't hear it preached a whole bunch. You may not find it on TV. But it's the Word of God. And we need to subject ourselves and not be fearful of the judgment of God. Because guess what? Once that thing is put to death, once that thing is under the blood of Jesus, once that thing the God has seen that you're dealing with it, guess what? That thing won't haunt you anymore. And if it does come back to haunt you, you do it again. And you do it again. And you do it again. And I'll liken it unto feeding a stray cat. If you quit putting the milk out, it will eventually quit coming. Don't feed those things on the inside of us. Let's bring them under judgment. Jan brought an example to me just a few weeks ago in the office. She was like, she knew in her mind, didn't you? She knew right then. She said, I knew, I knew that wasn't God. I knew that wasn't God's thought in there. I knew. And she took a hold of it right then and there. And I thought, you know what? Maybe we need to be talking to one another about how we do that. Because maybe it would help somebody else know how to get through something that was tough. Man, I was just fighting these feelings. Let's, let's take rejection. Why don't we lay that thing to death? I bet we'd be witnessing more. I bet we'd be happier. I bet we wouldn't be looking on Facebook to see how many people liked our picture. Come on. I mean, seriously. I mean, there are some people who literally, it's a thrill. Can I reach the magic number of likes to exceed what I had the other day? What? What? What kind of a shallow mind is that? It's a mind full of rejection. It's a mind full of rejection. So Lord, I just bring those thoughts of rejection, I just bring them under judgment right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I just put that thing to death. I'm going to be rejected just like you were rejected, Jesus. And it's going to be all right. <laughs> when they want to talk about me, when they want to persecute me, it's okay. Because the same thing happened to you. And the Bible says that I'm blessed when they do these things. Yes. So I bring that thing under judgment. And I command that thing to be put to death, that thought to go into my mind. I command it to be put to death right now in the name of Jesus. And you're not being resurrected. You're dead. And I'm a new creation. Amen. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Set free from the curse of the law. A child of God I am. And now I'm walking by faith in the power of His might. I can't remember the song, but it's something like that. I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ. If you've been around here very long, you know that song. But you had been around here a long time. Amen. We sang it all the time. Come on. You're children of God. Yes. You do not have to live a tormented life. But if we don't bring our thoughts under judgment of the Word of God and our actions and our attitudes. Anybody ever been in just bad mood? What about bringing that thing under judgment according to the Word? Oh, well, I, I don't know what the Word of God says. Everybody has a bad day. This is the day that the Lord hath made, and they will be glad and rejoice in it. That is not room for a bad mood. Amen. I bring that under judgment. I'm going to get my happy feet on. Amen? I'm going to get my happy feet on. Stand to your feet tonight.
I didn't want to keep you for a long time, but at the same time, I, I just felt I needed to finish that. And I, 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 I could have finished it with something a little lighter, but it's okay. It just kept hitting in me. You need to do this. You need to do this. And I'm like, okay, I got it. I got gotcha. you. Lord, judge our thoughts and intents of our hearts by your word. And when we stand guilty, forgive us. And let the blood of Jesus cleanse us. Let us ask for forgiveness in your name and let repentance come to us. And let those things be put to death in our lives in the name of Jesus. All those just put to death, all those things that destroy us. In Jesus' name. Father God, do the work. Let your word, let your word go in and let it work mightily on the inside of us. Oh, Father. Fornication, all uncleanness, covetousness. Let it not even be named among us. Filthiness, foolish talking, coarse jesting. It's not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For you know this, that no fornicator, unclean person, covetous man who's an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Don't be partakers with them. Bring it under judgment. Let that conviction and let that repentance work in your heart. That you can truly say, the word has worked mightily on the inside of me. I am going to walk in freedom. Because I am going to walk according to your word. Forgive us, God, for the times we've come short. Help us to judge ourselves so we won't be judged. And let us do it in our own lives and not in the lives of somebody else. Let us take accountability for the word working mightily inside of us. And Lord, may you be given all the praise and all the glory and all the honor for what you can do. All the glory will go to you. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. I hope that word helps somebody tonight. I hope it doesn't bring confusion. And if it does, just call me and I'll help you walk it through it because I just tried to go over it briefly. But let's put this to work. And let's watch ourselves get free. Let's watch ourselves get free. Remember those words. I bring those actions attitudes and things that I've done under the judgment of God and death is on them. They are buried never to be resurrected again. Amen? Amen. In Jesus name. Hallelujah. If you need prayer tonight, please make sure you do not leave this place.